Transfer Tuesday on the Pick 6 Podcast. Hello, everybody. I'm Sam McCune along with Evan Bland. Yes, we've reversed the order um, because we're going to talk about Nebraska baseball in a minute. Uh, Jimmy Watkins will join us in a minute uh, to talk about why Marcus Washington transferred to Nebraska. That happened today. Um, Washington, the Texas player who, as we may recall, was connected to Nebraska about five years ago yep. with Mike Riley. He transferred to Nebraska. That now makes 15 transfers for the Huskers. Uh, midway through this podcast, we are going to have a transfer draft where all three of us, Jimmy, Evan, and myself, have uh, five players each, and we draft. Evan gets the first pick. He won Paper, Rock, Scissors before the podcast began. He was Rock. I was Scissors. And so Evan will have the first pick. We will get to that information uh, and the transfer draft in a little while. We'll talk about Marcus Washington. We'll talk about Stephon Wynn. Uh, who uh, was uh, committed to Nebraska on Sunday night. Um, Washington will be here this weekend. Wynn may be here right now. We'll hit the high school recruiting stuff, which is going to be huge next week, um, but we'll we'll hit all the transfer stuff. This is kind of their team. I mean, this is kind of the team that they're going to have for 2022, and I think you can make the argument that so as go the transfers, so go the Huskers, uh, that these 15 players are deployed into such crucial spots um, within the program that their success is going to be a big piece of Nebraska's success, with the exception maybe the offensive line, where the two transfers there may not uh, end up starting for the Huskers. We'll also talk a little bit of basketball. Uh, Bryce McGowan's at the uh, NBA Combine. Latman has left the program. He's going to sign a pro contract in Australia. That was expected for some time. Uh, and, uh, so that, that, that happened. Um, and then we're still waiting on Trey McGowan's. What is Trey McGowan's going to do? Is he going to, is he going to play at Nebraska? Is he going to go to the NBA? He's not currently in school. Uh, he was with his brother Bryce at the, uh, um, at the combine. And so, uh, we'll talk a little bit with, uh, with Jimmy about that. Uh, and then we'll, we'll be out, but we're going to start with Nebraska baseball. Uh, the season is already over. We don't have to talk about Nebraska baseball, Evan, for many, many, many months, most likely. Uh, so this will be the last time we talk about them for a while. Um, it was a faceplant of a season. I don't want to. I don't want to sugarcoat it. They were twenty-three and twenty. Uh, twenty-three and thirty. That's the worst record since nineteen seventy-five. Is that right? Yeah. By the worst 1%. record since 1975. Granted, they're not playing Peru, Peru State, UNK, and some of the John Sanders specials uh, from the 90s, but um, this was a bad team in a bad league. Uh, at most, you're going to see three Big Ten teams get into the NCAA tournament. Maryland, who is actually quite good. Rutgers, who's probably going to make it as a three, and then potentially a third team if that team wins the Big Ten tournament, which starts Wednesday, and you were over there. Uh, talking to those folks today over the Big Ten coaches. But Nebraska finished ninth, or did they finish 10th? I can't remember. They finished ninth. Ninth, yeah. In a league that was only going to get three bids. This is not a good league. This is Big 12 North circa, I don't know, 2005. Uh, and Nebraska wasn't very good, or 2004. And Nebraska wasn't any good back then in football, so we need to call it what it is. It's Bill Callahan 04, you know, going 5 and 6 in the Big 12 North that year. This is kind of like that. I mean, this was a this was a terrible season for Nebraska. Uh, they were picked to win the Big Ten by the coaches and the media. Yes, and they were a preseason top twenty five team, and they finished twenty three and thirty. And it was nothing short of not good. Um, we can talk a lot about football and why that happened. We know why it happened. Basketball. There's so many situations with basketball and so many issues. Um, that they had coming into the year and they've had for several years that uh, I'm I'm more inclined than maybe some other people to give Fred Hoiberg a little bit more time. Obviously, Bolt's not going anywhere. He's done a great job at Nebraska winning a Big Ten title last year, but this was a Big Ten title winning team last year, and they don't even make the tournament this year. What the hell happened? <laughs> How much time do we have? No, it uh, it was a mess it, it, from, from the start. And, you know, I'll say I, I put together – the preseason Big Ten rankings also, I, I did not pick Nebraska to win. In fact, I, I can't remember anybody else locally or nationally that didn't, and and that's not because, you know, of whatever. For one, I thought Maryland was that good. Um, but Nebraska, I mean, to, to have picked them to win the title this year, you 
had to take a lot of leaps of faith. You had to believe that that next wave of players behind these seniors who were critical parts of that team were ready to take the, the jump and to be major contributors. And that just wasn't the case this year. Uh, you know, it, it, and, and it, it manifested in all sorts of ways, Sam. I mean, some of those showed up in statistics. Some of them didn't. It wasn't a very good defensive team. And, you know, sometimes that came out in errors. Sometimes that just was misplays in the field. Just little stuff that sort of stacked up over and over again. Um, you know, I think just in the, the intangible kind of cultural side of it was interesting because last year's team had such strong, competitive leaders. And it felt like this year they really kind of dragged their feet on figuring out who that was going to be. And it was like, well, this, this guy's going to be a starter in the rotation, so he should probably be a guy. And this guy's going to be one of our better hitters, so maybe he should be a, a captain too. And it just, they, they never had that that killer instinct, that sort of daily grind mentality that last year's team was so good at. Um, so that part didn't manifest. The offense was awful, historically awful. I mean, they 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 hit right around 250 for the year, which was again you got to go back to the 70s uh, to see a Nebraska team that's hit that poorly. And that's happened in a climate, by the way, in the Big Ten where scoring was way up this year. I mean, a lot of pitchers were drafted last year. You had all these new rotations, underdeveloped players because of the league only season, and. Nebraska just could not score runs. You know, forget about clutch hits. They couldn't get productive outs. You know, first and third with with one out, it'd be a pop up or it'd be a strikeout. And so, you know, you, you kind of roll all those things together, and it was a team that just never figured it out. They won two Big Ten series all season. Again, and a down year for the league. Michigan State and Ohio State. Michigan State and Ohio State, and otherwise they they couldn't finish series. Uh, there were close games. There were blowouts. They were not uh, discriminate as to how they lost games. They lost them in all manners. You've talked about it before. They played a lot of close games, which is indicative of, you know, a team that's that's certainly not dominant, and they weren't able to finish a lot of those either. Who's and, the fourth seed in the Big Ten tournament? Uh, Illinois. Illinois. So Nebraska went, if I'm not mistaken, um, two and seven against the top four teams in the league. Is that right? They didn't play Maryland. Swept by Rutgers, didn't play Maryland. Two, uh, one and one two and against two. Iowa and yeah. against Illinois. Mm-hmm. And then if you throw Michigan in there, they were the fifth team. They one went, and two. They went three and, they went three and nine mm-hmm. against the top five teams in the league. Um, the reason I bring that up is I kind of put it in my Monday Rewind that for whatever you want to say about Nebraska football, you know, Nebraska football played seven, teams, seven nine-win teams in the Big Ten. Lost to them all, but they played them. Uh, in a lot of ways, Nebraska baseball did not really have that much exposure to the most elite teams no. um, in the league, and, and in many cases, they had them at home. They they had they had a favorable schedule, and it just didn't it just didn't break their way, you know. And then of course they go up and lose the two to Minnesota. If they win two at, out of three at Minnesota, they're in. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, Minnesota's horrible, horrible team, and they weren't able to do it. So. You love baseball at all levels, and I think you follow it a lot more closely than most, certainly more closely than me. I have people in my life who love the game and know the game really well, and so there's a relationship. Is there a relationship between when you get great pitching, it's like a, I want to use the right word here, it frees up the hitters and it makes them better. Like, Nebraska had great pitching last year, you know? I mm-hmm. mean, elite pitching. They had a, a, a true Friday night starter in Cade Povich. Um, they had a weird Saturday starter who gave people a hard time and chance Roach. And they had an elite relief group that was, you know, on the back end with Spencer Schwellenbach. Did that free up the offense to just play better? Because they knew that they weren't going to have to, you know, the pitching wasn't bad this year. No, you, you've talked about that. it was decent, and they attacked the strike zone. They didn't give a bunch of walks. They didn't, they didn't chick, chicken crap their way out of stuff. Like they, they tried and they, they competed, but they weren't great. Does great pitching do something for an offense? In other words, were the offensive weaknesses kind of here, but great pitching helped to kind of paper over those things. And once they didn't have great pitching, 
that sort of mindset kind of fell apart because they needed more from the offense and the offense wasn't able to deliver? Well, I, th- I think it was just kind of a culmination of, of two things happening at once where they lose that elite pitching. Like, if you would take the 2021 offense and put it on this team, this 2022 team, with the pitchers that they had this last year, I still think the offense would do pretty well because they had a lot of talented yeah. veteran guys. And that bore out in the Big Ten this year. I mean, Maryland is a veteran team. Rutgers is a veteran team. And those, then that's why those teams were so dominant mm-hmm. offensively. I think I think sometimes there's you know we talk about it in football a lot where you you want to get ahead because then you can kind of open things up a little bit. I think that's true in baseball and certainly it's true for how Nebraska wants to play baseball too where they they want to take some chances on the base paths. They want hit and runs. They want stolen bases. They want to you know lay down a bunt not necessarily to sacrifice but to put pressure on the defense. And when you fall behind because you're getting hit like you're you're just going to be less apt to take those risks and I think we saw that a lot I mean Nebraska's stolen bases were down so some of it was personnel they just didn't have the the, the speedsters to do it um, but I, I think they're, they're all sort of intertwined right like if your pitching's not as good then your hitters know that like there's pressure on them to hit and, and I heard about that a lot last year a lot of the hitters said that like they felt pressure first and third with one out. That should be that moment where you're, where the pitcher is feeling the pressure. But in a, in a lot of cases, that was Nebraska hitters feeling it because they knew we haven't come through in this situation very much. And oh man, if we if I strike out here, here we go again. And so I think that really sort of added up. I thought Max Anderson had an interesting thought midway through the year where he used the term hero ball, which you hear a lot for basketball, right? Where you you want to kind of create your own shot and do your own thing. He, he felt like there was some of that in the, on the baseball team too, where instead of identifying their roles and sticking to that, whether that's get on base, whether that's, you know, put pressure with your legs, whatever, like all the guys were trying to do too much um, and, and be kind of hero heroes about it. And, and that sort of, that manifests when your defense is shaky and that manifests when your pitchers are going to get hit. And so I think some of that, it all sort of bleeds into each other. And so a lot of these confluence of circumstances sort of hit Nebraska at the wrong time. Yeah, when you have first and third with one out, the the goal there is to score the one run. Mm-hmm. And I understand the whole, you know, um, three-run homer, Earl Weaver thing. I get it. And those are great. You know, it's, it's just terrific to be able to do that. Usually those happen first and second, no out. But you, you got first and third, one out. The goal is to get the one in. And you do that however you got to do it. Which means, if you've got to, you know, if you've got to kind of slap at a ball, um, put it into the right side, or put it out in the outfield, fly it out, and take the out, like you're talking with productive outs, and they really struggled with that. And I just, you know, I just wonder if it was like one one runs not enough. Like we're down four, we we need four, or you know, well it's early and we can get this one, but we know we're not going to hold that, so we need to try to get big innings. Somewhere in there, it felt like there was some sort of, like you were saying, hero ball or mindset where Nebraska's still trying to trying to score three when, and you know this well, baseball's going to tell you, you got to get the one. You just got to get the one, and you have to. Like, it's it's worse to get zero than it, this won't make, maybe, this, maybe you disagree with this. It's worse to get zero than it's great to get three, mindset-wise. Like, if you have first and third and one out, and you don't get anything. And then maybe that happens again. It's not good. Like that 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 takes a toll on a team's psyche more than the positive hit off of what well, we got three that time. Because baseball is so mental and so situational that like part of how a baseball team builds its confidence and its belief in itself is the execution of situations. Mm. And it felt like they were not good at executing situations. And when team when a baseball team is not good at that, they're honestly not that good. Because very rarely can a team just just bash it the way LSU did twenty five years ago. Teams are just not that talented anymore and the pitchers are too good for you to just hammer it all over the yard the way they used to. What's what's interesting to me is I it seemed like the offense made sort of a philosophical shift this year. So yeah. you told so, you talked about it before the season. So you look back, set it up a few years ago. Darren, when Darren Erstad was here, his first like five or six years here, he had a major league approach to the offense, which was 
play for the beginning. If you have, you know, if you score three or more runs in an inning, the odds of you winning the game are really high. Mm-hmm. And he shifted late in his tenure at Nebraska into more of a bunt him over, bunt them in, or you know, bring him in sort of of offense. And his reasoning for that was he he sort of came to the realization. He's told me this. He came to the realization that. College baseball is different than the pros. You know, you're not we've talked you're, about you're not hitting it to major league infielders. You're hitting That's it right. to college infielders, and so, and, and Will Bolt would have said this for 2021 as well. Where just because you're laying down a bunt doesn't mean you're necessarily giving up an out. They see that as you're putting pressure on the defense to make a play, and on so often you see those throws go into you know right field down the line, whatever it might be. And so I was a little bit, I thought it was noteworthy this spring when Will Bolt said they felt like they had so much depth in their lineup that they were going to go away from some of that and, and just let them swing away. Um, and so, you know, maybe that, that, was, that was them trying to adjust to their personnel, but I also felt like it got away from what was so successful with last year's offense too. So it'll be interesting moving forward to see how much – they want to bring back the sacrifice bunt, and they did still sacrifice a decent amount, but they I think they pulled back on what made them so successful as a unit in 2021, and um, you know we'll just see kind of how that go, how that looks moving forward. But it was a shift for sure. Yeah, and you know like part of what analytics will do is analytics will give you a really really good sense of like big picture dynamics. Like analytics will tell you that in football that. The team that has more explosive plays wins the game. Like explosive plays is an informant, an indicator of how well, you know, your performance. Unless you suck at the situations, unless you suck at red zone and you suck at third and one, guess what? Here's the, here's the trick. Teams that tend to have a lot of explosive plays also tend to be good at situations. And do you know why? Why, Evan? Because they have the talent. Because they're good teams. Yeah. And so the so what so what begins this 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 takeaway this standout thing that people kind of pluck away. It's not that it's wrong. There is a correlation between Alabama producing all of these explosive plays and Clemson producing all these explosive plays and also being good. But it's just corollary. In many ways, the things that piss off coaches the most, the things that they harp on most in practice, are the things that the players want to execute the best because it creates a sense of security in the coaches who coached it. Which is why not being able to run inside zone is a big deal for coaches because it's like we can't even run a stinking inside zone we got to get a quarterback involved and motion and all this other stuff just to gain seven we can't just hand it off to a back put him behind our five linemen and plow and in baseball i think there's a sense of if you can't do the things that baseball players and coaches have done for generations and nebraska struggled at those things it eats away at the confidence of a team. Being, I, I, and again, that's 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 the, the antithesis of Moneyball. We know that anybody who's ever read the book knows that Billy Bean got, you know, there was all this hang up on speed and all these other things. And I get it, I get it. And and fundamentally, I'm a Moneyball kind of person. But there's a secondary level of analytics that comes into play where you have to start to remove for. X, Y, and Z, and you have to start to look at, okay, so now that we've taken the numbers and now we've taken, now we've got to look at the sort of colloquial, like setup things that you do, and are we good there too? And from my perspective, watching Nebraska on TV, because I didn't get to many games this year, um, as a fan, just sitting in the stands, I just didn't. The little things were the things that were missing. And when, when we talked to Scott Frost about what, what, what is it, it's the little things. Mm-hmm. And what is that? The little things are not, we can't, Nebraska's created more explosive plays. They created them by the bushel last year. They get down to the seven and they couldn't score because they didn't have a field goal kicker who could make a 27-yard field goal. Right. And every single time a guy misses a 27-yard field goal in football, it's like, it's like a stab to the heart of the mm-hmm. team. They're like, so we got all the way down there and we did all that work and we bring this guy out here and all he's here to do is that and he can't do it. It's like the, the the collective temperature on the team just goes, mm-hmm. and in baseball, I think that's part of what happened in Nebraska. They would get in these situations, 
Yeah, there's a reason why Bryce Matthews in the second to last game, you know, is like flipping out over doing that, you know, having a home run and all that. It was him, right? Or was it? Yeah, Max it was Anderson? him. Yep. Because they executed. They actually, like, got it done. There's still a sense of accomplishment and pleasure in getting it done in the miniature, even if you don't get it done in the maximum. And I think Nebraska just wasn't good enough in doing the miniature stuff. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. And So what does it look like now? Okay, so, like, what is it? where do they go now? Like, um, they have, how many players of junior college players have they signed? It appears that the program's going to go through basically an overhaul in the off season, Lots of guys are probably going to leave and they're adding a bunch of guys almost to say is like, well, you guys didn't get it done. So we're going to bring in these guys. Is that accurate? It is. It's, it's, we, we talk about roster management and football and it's, of course it's insane there. It's, it's less so in baseball, but it's still pretty complicated, especially when you factor in the COVID year. So they've got nine junior college players right now, ready to roll seven high school players. And so Sort of Say that again, nine and nine seven? Nine and seven. So the first step is going to be over this next month, who, who, which seniors decide to leave, and some of that will be informed by the draft and whether any have a chance to go to pro ball. But Dawson McCarvel, who ended up being a midweek starter, a transfer from Grand Canyon, he's, gonna, he's the only player who's out of eligibility, so you know he's gone. Everybody else on that uh, senior class – could could go a number of ways. Shea Shanneman could come back. Cody Frank, another weekend starter, could come back. Griffin Everett, who was the catcher all year, one of their best hitters, could stay or could go. They kind of need him to come back, goes. don't they? Uh, they? They like some of their young guys, like Josh Karen, but, yeah, they'd be I mean, nice. From if the pitching could, per- perspective. From the per- yes, from the pitching perspective, it would be nice to have those weekend guys back. Jake Buns and Kyle Perry, who were supposed to be two of their best pitchers this year and were hurt most of the season, We'll see what that looks like for them. If Perry they, could be out for a whole another year, right? Uh, I would think he'd be back at some point next year. He okay. had Tommy John surgery. Um, it's his second one. Sometimes they recover actually quicker from those surgeries the second time around. Okay. Um, so, so you've got this the senior decisions. You've got the any potential draft uh, departures probably as unsigned free agents uh, in this particular class. No draftees. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, it's only a 20-round 20 20 draft this year. That's still shortened from what it used to be at 40. Um, and you saw you know, multiple guys at Nebraska have gone as undrafted players recently. Aaron Polensky was undrafted and has had some success. Jackson Hallmark last year went undrafted and has had some success. So you might see a guy or two go. Um, but then it's, yeah, it's going to be a reset with that roster. You're going to see okay. a lot of it, – it's not, it's not the transfer portal for football, but you, look, you start looking at some of these junior college players, you see a lot of – pitchers and you see a lot of outfielders specifically who they feel like uh, they need to come in and, and compete for jobs right away so it's going to be a much looking much different looking team and to be clear junior colleges in baseball are very different from junior colleges in football in football junior college I'd say 90 percent of the athletes who go to junior college are there because they could they could qualify not all of them Will Honus was an, an exception Aaron Rodgers was an exception most guys that go to Juco are there because they couldn't they couldn't go to the school they wanted to go to because they couldn't get in. And baseball it's not that. There are a lot of guys that go to junior college because their the scholarship numbers at a lot of these schools don't now that may change. Yes. But they don't really pan out. And so part of what happens is you know you're going to go to a JUCO and you're probably going to matriculate to a pretty good school. Cade Povich is an example. Mm-hmm. I think Cade probably could have gone to a few places out of out of Bell West. But I think you go to JUCO, you, you prove it, and then you're going to be in a good spot going into college. So people would look at nine junior college football signees, and they'd be like, oh, Basket, baseball, it's different, right? It is. A lot of these guys are, guys are going to come in and play right away. The junior college baseball is not that far below what's going on at the – not no. an SAC level. No, Nebraska's had some good luck with it over the years. They have. Tanner Lubach I mean, was one a few years Povich ago. Is Povich one of the best. Is, is the example. Yeah. Jake Buns was a, a JUCO guy. Cam Wynn, I believe, also, who was drafted last year. And Will Bolt and his staff have a history of finding those guys, especially in the, you know, the Kansas area and, and in the Midwest. Um, you know, Cody Frank was a junior college guy too. So, yes, that's it's it's a method of recruiting. Um, it's, it's just different. And those guys will come in and, and have a chance to play right away. Freshmen, 
in freshman baseball players, you see them contribute too. But like, I think the rate if you if you were to find like the high end junior college baseball players that go to a D one program, there's got to be a very high hit rate there of guys that end up contributing. As opposed to saying a highly rated freshman who comes in, you don't always know Drew what Christo. you're going to get. Drew Christo is a, an example of is that. Is something wrong sure. there, or is that going to get turned around? <sighs> he just, you know, he had the one pitch this year. Command was was elusive at times. He was healthy, as far as I'm aware. And they just felt like he needed more time to acclimate. So he was a top 100 recruit. Yeah. We'll see how that goes. But, I mean, that certainly played a part in things, too. And that the, the, the challenge here is they, they, they got to the point where, A, they started playing fewer and fewer non-conference games because they were getting toward the end of the year and they had finals and all that. B, they had no margin for error. And when you eliminate a margin for error, you can't go throw a guy out there midweek and find out. You can't do it more than once. So I think that was part of the challenge, too, is like, you know, I think a lot of eggs were put in the we need to make the Big Ten tournament basket. You wrote about it, I think, four weeks before the end of the season, and, and rightfully so, Evan, rightfully so. But I I think what you wrote was in part a reflection of what the team was thinking about, yes? Like, we're not in the top eight teams, and we need to find a way to do it. And to be honest with you, outside of the final weekend, which I guess they won two out of three, they managed to fritter away the one game against Minnesota, the disastrous Rain delayed game against Illinois that they never should have blown, uh, and then you know the game against Indiana. It felt like pressure kind of got to them at late. It did, and they had they had so much help along the way. I mean, Indiana got swept on the last weekend. Uh, it, all the teams in the bottom four or five, and, and you wrote about that too about the log jam between fifth and twelfth in the league played out. I mean, all those teams. <laughs> Nebraska had every chance to pass most of those teams, and they didn't do it. And so, you know, the the conversation I thought last weekend about the whole Purdue cancellation thing was was humorous in the sense that, like, how did how did it come down to this? How did it come down to Nebraska having to worry about the weather six hundred miles to the east and to worry about the curfew policy for Maryland on a Saturday night? Yeah. Like, it, it never should have come down to that. And and I mean, again, like. Like putting it all together, you, you have to put it all in context, right? Because like we said, they were preseason favorites. They were a top twenty-five preseason team, mm-hmm. and this is how this is what they were reduced to at the end. So certainly a humbling but fitting end of their year. Last question, and then we'll get on to transfers as Jimmy Watkins joins us. Okay, so what's the calendar here? A lot of guys scatter. Anybody going to the anybody going to the East Coast League? What do they call it? Cape Cod. Yeah. Anybody going to Cape Cod? Max Anderson yeah. for sure. Usually that's where your best prospects go. Yep. So and he'll he'll be there. Uh, it'll be a lot of summer ball. A lot of Huskers usually end up in the Northwoods League. Northwoods League, which up in Wisconsin is, and yeah. Iowa and Minnesota. So you're, yeah, your top players go to like the Cape and and some of those places to face the best competition. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, Nebraska puts an emphasis on on uh, emphasis on where can you get the most at bats or the most innings. And and Northwoods tends to have been that place for them. Is that a wood bat league? Yes, okay. it is. So and they're Cape gonna, Cod is a wood bat league. I believe so. Yes. Okay. Now, the transfer rules in baseball, they're going to lose some players. Some players are just going to leave. Some. They have not lost many not the of the M- Not the MLB portal. draft. They might get a guy that lo- that decides to leave because of that. But yeah. they're, uh, I'm talking young players here. Yeah, maybe. There hasn't been all that much movement in the roster in the portal era for, for the baseball team. But yeah, they might lose a couple. Yeah. You've got the draft in mid-July. Uh, you might find someone out of the portal or two. I think a lot of your biggest Big Ten success stories have come about because teams found players out of the portal. Yeah. Whether that's other D1s, D2, D3, even some NAIA. So we'll see what Nebraska does there too. But um, yeah, so that's that's kind of how it's going to go. And then they'll report back in August. Yeah, it'll be an interesting interesting thing to watch. Um, just what the roster looks like, how it's different. Um, I I think you would agree that the Big Ten is not going to get dramatically better next year. Maybe it will. Maybe I, I be agree some, with that. Some, some young teams, but um, it, it, it's just not generally a power league. Uh, hard to say if Nebraska would have been better in the Big 12 because sometimes the competition can make you step up your level. And I think I do think that the name across the front of that jersey when it's Rutgers, you're like, well, we'll beat Rutgers at least once, and then you don't beat them at all. 
Uh, and then you see that name, and you look at the record of Minnesota, and well, we'll beat them at least twice, and then you only beat them once, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So They didn't beat TCU either. So you That's know. true. That's true. Um, I guess we'll never know. All right, moving on to transfers. So Nebraska received two transfers, uh, and it may be their final two transfers. In fact, I expect it to be their final two transfers. Stephon Wynn on Sunday night, which we kind of largely expected to happen. I can talk about him in a minute and how they can kind of work that defensive front. And then the other one was Marcus Washington, who committed today. Uh, that had been rumored to happen for a couple of days, but he committed today. Six foot two, 190 190-pound receiver out of Texas. Originally went to Trinity Catholic High School in St. Louis. That is now closed, by the way. Um, and he was part of a Lindenwood University camp that they had in 2017 with Coach Mike Riley. Uh, Isaiah Williams, who's now the top receiver at Illinois, was there. Stephon... Um, I think it's Stephon Cooper. I can't remember. Shaman Cooper uh, was there uh, as a linebacker. He's also at Illinois. Uh, a tight end who happened to be there and did not come to Nebraska is the top tight end at Iowa right now. Uh, he was oh. a per- he was a family friend of of Tanner Farmer, and oh, Nebraska wow. did not recruit him. Hmm. Ouch! They could have oh. had them both. Wow. Uh, so yeah, uh, there was a bunch of different guys there who were pretty good players. That guy might have been the best player of the bunch. He's going to end up being uh, Sam Laporta. I'm talking about. Yeah, he'll end up being a two, you know, uh, second day draft pick. Um, but anyway, Nebraska worked a lot of those guys out. Marcus Washington went to Texas, and now he is at Nebraska. And Jimmy, you talked to his father today about his story. Why did Marcus Washington pick Nebraska? Well, speaking of family friends, um, Marcus Washington's father knew knew. Grew up one door down from the cousin of Nebraska director of high school relations, Kenny Wilhite. Hmm. They played uh, high school football about 18 miles apart. They grew up together. They spent summers together. And throughout this process, um, Marcus's dad is, is very concerned about what Marcus's life is going to look like after football. He thinks his, you know, he encourages his son to chase NFL dreams, but... He also wants he's, he was impressed by the things that were not about football, which is what he said were the conversations that he had with Will Height. And that's things like um, the the kind of Nebraska has a setup where they they're very hands on. They, they offer a lot of resources for student athletes after they graduate, um, that sort of thing. But I think. I mean, part of it, too, is that Casey Thompson and, and Marcus Washington played together at Texas. Those guys have pretty good chemistry. Um, Marcus saw an elevated an elevated role at Texas last year while Casey was the starter. He caught some passes from Hudson Card, too, but mostly played with Casey. Um, his dad has been talking to Mark Whipple a lot. He's been impressed by Whipple. He thinks Mark Whipple's offense, he likes the pro style. He thinks that'll better prepare his son to play in the NFL. He also likes that Lincoln is smaller than Texas or smaller than Austin because he thinks that it will help his son focus on just football, which is obviously what we're talking about here. Are but you saying Austin is a more interesting town than Lincoln? I didn't say it. That's what that's what Nunu Washington said. That's a common said. refrain from that's, parents. That's of what Nunu Washington players. said. I didn't say it. That's just what the parents said. So yeah, I think it's um this is more of a, a life call, I guess, than it is a football call. Of course, it's a football call because you're making the decision where you're going to play football. But it's a it's a bigger picture. Marcus's dad was a good football player in high school and then sort of steered down the wrong road, ended up in jail for a little bit, and he's determined for his son to carve out something better for him. That's a story I just wrote while you guys were talking about baseball. So I think that's why, if there's one big reason why Marcus Washington is here or going to be here. Speaking of baseball, they just, as we're talking about people leaving, Leighton Vanjoff, who was their left fielder for a lot of the year, decides he's going to transfer. So live as it happens, he's moving on. Yeah, I think it's going to be a couple of those. I, When you have a year like that, I think, don't you inevitably think, okay, things are going to change. I mean, they didn't bring all those junior college guys in to, you know, sit the bench and, you know, and eat hot dogs. So. <laughs> Uh, Marcus Washington is an interesting player. Um, you know, in, in some ways, he's the logical replacement for Xavier Betts. Uh, Betts is probably not coming back, or if he does at some point, that'll have to be you know a, a moderated or mediated process because I don't think there's a scholarship available for him. Washington's game is somewhat similar: long striding receiver, uh, good 50-50 ball downfield, kind of a deep ball guy. Um, you know, uh, fluid 
player. Um, probably not quite as fast or as dynamic as Betts, but but had his moment. And obviously has a relationship with Casey Thompson. Anytime you can go play with a quarterback who knows you and has thrown the football to you quite a bit, um, I think that's encouraging. And so he probably becomes one of their X receivers, right? Um, you know, in this particular offense, I think that uh, you know Whipple is going to move guys around. They're going to they're going to learn multiple positions. They're going to be all over. But I think it's fair to say that. Trey Palmer will probably be very close to the number one option. Omar Manning will be, you know, up there too. Um, Garcia Castaneda, we'll see. Got to figure out a way to use Oliver Martin mm -hmm. in a way where he actually gets the football. Alante Brown. Alante Brown. I think we feel. I think I feel pretty good about where Alante Brown is going to play on the field. Um, he needs a maneuver in the middle of the field. I'd say most part. Um, but Washington's probably a guy that you stick outside, and you you know he's one of your outside receivers, uh, valuable in the red zone, a uh, guy that can hit deep routes between the numbers and the and the sideline, um, you know, and then you can also probably bring him over the middle and get him to catch something over the top of a corner, get inside of a corner, get over the top of a safety, those kind of things. I I wouldn't describe him as a as an NFL draft pick at this point, but I wouldn't have described Samari Touré that way either, and Touré was drafted. So um, it's an interesting pickup for Nebraska. Um, the other one that they got uh, was Stefan Wynn, uh, six foot four, three hundred and seven pounder from Alabama. Played four seasons there. Was effectively just behind players who are really good. And uh, early in his career, he was behind some guys that are already in the NFL. This most recent year, he's basically behind three seniors. Um, I wouldn't describe any of those guys as like first round picks at this moment. But they're all pretty good players, and he's kind of the fourth guy, and he probably wasn't going to play a ton there. He just he would have played some. I think it would have been in a rotation. Alabama does tend to run kind of a three-four, but they also kind of run that you know whatever you call what Nebraska does that two-four-five, that's four-two-five, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so Wynn probably wasn't going to get a ton of time on the playing field. And Alabama has very dynamic players, either right outside the tackles. Or behind them, so their inside linebackers are good. Their outside linebacker, obviously Will Anderson being one of them, are good. And so a lot of the featured players within that defense were were those particular guys. So when comes here, he's gonna probably have two years. Uh, he was a 2018 enrollee at Alabama. Um, obviously, the 2020 year doesn't count because of COVID. So he's probably got two years left, and I think uh, could be a really nice player. They've basically reset themselves on the defensive line. Um, if you're going to say Phil Darius Payne, Jordan Riley, Casey Rogers, I think the three that they've got, Mathis, Drew, Devin Drew, and Wynn, have greater potential than the three they lost. Um, now we'll see if that potential becomes a thing. But I think that they probably got a little bit better in terms of their talent. I think all three, you know, Drew's a three-star, Wynn's a four-star, Mathis is a four-star. Um you know, and, and, and Jordan Riley was a four-star, but he, he didn't play a lot of football in, at, the, at the major college level. He didn't. He's been hurt a lot. Rodgers was a hard, kind of a ham and egg, three-star guy that, that bulked up and worked really hard, and I, I wish Nebraska still had him. And then uh, Payne, was, Payne was a guy that probably needed to play, and I don't know what he'll do at Virginia Tech. I assume he'll be an outside backer. He's a little heavy for that. He's, he's a guy that probably needs to be an undersized defensive tackle, and he wasn't. That's what he was in JUCO. He's been he, he's not quite fast enough at this level. And O'Shawn Mathis, a little leaner, a little taller, is. That creates a scenario now where Nebraska has 15 transfers. And, Jimmy, what you did not know is that we are going to do a transfer draft. I'm ready. Each one of us get five, and we are going to carry this through the season. We're doing this draft now. And if they had a 16th player, I guess – that will go for a player to, to, to soon be determined. Uh, but but uh, we did paper, rock, scissors before the podcast. Evan won, so he goes first. I go second because you weren't here. You go third. There. And then it's a snake draft, so you get third <coughs> and fourth, okay. so on and so forth. Um, so we're going to do a transfer draft. Evan, you get the first pick. A lot of pressure here. A lot Probably of ways you could go. With this year in mind? Well... I mean, that's what Nebraska's thinking. I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. Although, you know, there's some considerations to be made for, for out guys. Yeah. especially with some of these younger guys. But yeah. we can carry this out for a couple of years. But we'll definitely revisit we'll it. Be redoing we'll it, revisit but, yeah. it, you know, um, during the season a couple different times. 
You have the very first pick. I mean, yeah, I, I got to go with Casey Thompson, the 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 likely quarterback starter, the first quarterback other than Adrian Martinez to to hitch his cart to to Scott Frost's horse mm. or or however you want to say it. So, uh, starts with that man, new quarterback. How is he different from Adrian? How does, how different does the offense look? Give me Casey Thompson. I'll take O'Shawn Mathis. Uh, the outside linebacker, pass rusher, who's here for probably one, but maybe two years. Um, just a dynamic player, I think, can come off the edge and can create some problems for opposing defenses that will also free or opposing offenses that will also free up interior pass rushers. So I'll take O'Shawn Mathis. You get third and fourth picks, Jimmy. Uh, I'll take Trey Palmer, mm-hmm. and I will take Tommy Hill Ooh. for similar reasons. Okay. Um, both guys that we expect to be immediate impact players. I think we think Tommy Hill's going to get that second corner's job. Uh, we just talked about Trey Palmer being the number one option. But I also like, uh, particularly at these positions, I like flair. I like swagger. Mm-hmm. I like, both have it. Yes. I like talk. I like trash talk. I've talked to both of these players about trash talking to each other. Mm-hmm. And they're both very, they, get, they both get animated mm. when you ask them those questions. Um, both got the athletic traits that you're looking for out of that position and both i mean in in trey's case comes with some pretty some really high pedigree five-star kid from um from lsu originally no knows the position coach that's 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 huge and can set can because of that relationship i think can can set a tone in that room whereas most transfers don't get the chance to do that um and i think tommy hill nebraska wants quentin newsom to be big loud vocal guy this year he's the top corner they want him to assume that role um but that takes some adjusting too and i think that when you have someone like tommy hill who i've never seen him in a locker room or out of practice but it just seems like he takes more naturally to that to that setting um i think maybe he might at the very least help newsome along in that regard if not share some of that responsibility with him hmm It's my turn. A few ways you could go here, yeah. I'll take Devin Drew. Hmm. Uh, snap heavy guy that, that can do a lot of different things for Nebraska and and um, you know, I think can can hold up in there and and a savvy guy. If you get 25, 30 tackles out of him, he can be extremely valuable. Evan, you have the next two picks. I'm gonna go Timmy Bleak Road. Especially if Nebraska is going to continue to play these close games, as you've said, if you have a kicker that can make those twenty-seven yarders and makes your decisions easier, adjust your play calling. I mean, that guy can impact things a lot of ways if he's close to automatic, especially from the forty in. And I'm going to go. This is maybe more of a long-term pick, but I'm going to go Chuba Purdy. I think you know whether he gets significant snaps this year because of injury, how interesting he makes things in fall camp and moving forward. Uh, he just, I think he really impressed in the spring game and, and the, the limited chances that he got. So we'll see what his impact is this year, but I like him certainly long-term too. Hmm. All right. I'm going to go with a receiver too. I'm going to go with Isaiah Garcia Castaneda based on the things that I've heard about him and what he might be able to bring to the table bigger physically than I thought he would be. Uh, he's a fairly physically sized guy. He's probably six foot. But he's not 170 pounds. He's a he's a bigger guy, and I, he does actually remind me a little bit of Samari Touré, but only a little thicker. Um, I think he's going to have a nice season. I think they they like what he can bring to the table. My third pick is Isaiah Garcia Castaneda. I'm taking the new guys, I'm taking Marcus Washington and, and Stephon Wynn. Okay. Um, again, two guys that are going to play, which is I think great value at this point in the draft. Um, Marcus Washington, we talk about. I mean, a guy who could. Replace Xavier Betts. I know that's more of like a body type, player type comparison, yeah. but Nebraska had big plans for Xavier Betts this they year. Did. So, if you know, if you have, if there's any more similarities to their game beyond the body type and the speed, then we could be talking about something here. And of course, the chemistry that he has with the quarterback already is a huge advantage for him that none of these other receivers have. Um, I mean, they've got to play spring ball with Casey, but Mark Washington got to do a whole lot more than that. Uh, Stefan Wynn, same thing. He's, it's a, it's a. Not only is it he's playing, he's playing at a position that has been spotlighted for most of the off season, mm-hmm. be it via transfers or coaching changes or 
the def, you know the leader of that position group advocating for more players being brought in at that position. Um, so we heard in the spring that the offensive line was pushing the defensive line around a little bit. I think Stefan Wynn is part of the solution to that problem. Brian Buschini is my pick. Um, the punter, the FCS punter from Montana, had a hot and cold spring game. Um, it's my it's my feeling that a punter is more valuable than a kicker. Uh, at the collegiate level because of field position and because what I've watched is at the collegiate level, there aren't that many elite kickers. And you rarely run across them. Like, uh, I don't remember in the last several years running across an Alex Henry in the Big Ten. And there might have been, but I can't remember who it is, or a Justin Tucker or whatever. Punters, on the other hand, there's a lot of really, really, really good ones. Even if they make it in the NFL or not, they're elite and I think Buschini has the chance to at least bring Nebraska a little closer in the punts race. I don't know that he's the best in the league. In fact, I would say if he's in the top half, we'd be doing well. But Nebraska has not had a top half punter in some time, and I would, I'm would i very comfortable saying that last year they had the worst punting operation uh, in the Big Ten. I don't know if it's college football. So Brian Buschini is my fourth pick. Evan, you have two more back-to-back. The punts race. I like that. Yeah. I'm going to go uh, Williams and Williams. And Kevin Williams, I will say first, uh, he's a a strong character guy, like just talking with him. Like he's a guy who has kind of the personality that you want in a lineman. I saw him today. He has a really cute dog. (laughs) That doesn't help my point, but we'll we'll go with that. Yeah. That's worth something. Uh, He seems versatile. I mean, that he's lined up at. at, Doesn't help your point. Well, it's like the tough lineman who has the cute dog. But, you know, whether. Sure. Um, but, he, you know, he, he's lined up at tackle. He's been at, at guard. It seems like he's he's got the versatility, too. And then Kane Williams, who, to me, signals that Nebraska still is looking for a little something in the secondary. And, and you don't get that guy if you feel good about your top, like, six guys, right? Like, you, you probably go a different direction. So the fact that they like – that they bring him in in that climate um, – as a chance to contribute early, he's gone through an SEC season before, has a little bit of seasoning in that regard. Uh, give me Kane Williams, too. Been okay. big on the long-term guys, Evan. Purdy and Williams. Playing the long game. Interesting. Keeper that leaves league. me. I only have two left. There's oh. only two left, and I go first. Okay. So it's Hunter Anthony or Omar Brown. Okay. I'm, I'll take Hunter Anthony. Okay. Because you took Marcus Washington already. I did, yes. Yeah. I'll take Hunter Anthony, the Oklahoma State transfer. Um, I know I had Omar Brown high on my list uh, prior to the spring, but I I think there's injury issues there and just some things to work through. Hunter Anthony will be my final pick. Uh, Interesting player. I think could play at Nebraska. Has a couple of years left. Might be a tackle option. uh, Maybe a perimeter guy. Uh, Hunter Anthony will be my fifth pick. I guess that leaves me with Omar Brown. Mm -hmm. Um, Not to... You don't know much about Omar. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know much right. about Omar Brown, but he does have the words "All American" in his bio on Huskers.com. Um, so that's that's promising. And it, that jokes aside, that kind of pedigree is when you. It's one. You know, I think almost more important than stars for in terms of immediate impact. Obviously, the five star guys project better, but you know, a guy who has excelled in college football, not at this level, but a guy who has excelled in college football. Um, maybe he's sort of floated down the depth chart because of injuries for now, but if you need a guy who can step in immediately in case of other injury, I'm leaning towards the guy who has produced at the, at the college level before. All right. Well, there we go. Um, did you leave? A, did you keep a list of that? I did, yes. That's good. That's very good. Leighton Banjoff leaving. Want to surprise you? Uh, I don't know. I mean... He's one of those guys who who had it rough. I mean, there was a COVID year and he had an injury, and so it's um, it's been a little rough for him in that regard. But I don't know. I guess a little bit. I, they liked his bat. He was really good uh, in 2020 before the season got axed. But they're going to turn this thing over, man. The coaches were oh, it has. They, they were not happy with how things went. It's going to look a lot different. It's going to be really, really interesting. Okay, um, we'll get more to the high school recruiting uh, coming forward. Um, I thought we could talk briefly about any of Trev Albert's comments, if any of those jump out at you. Um, you know, the, the red balloon thing does not move my heart. Uh, I, and, and let me be clear why. I, I haven't been a fan of the program. I don't think I've held a red balloon 
Uh, I don't remember getting one as a college student. I don't think I've held a red balloon since I was in elementary school. And so um, it isn't something that, but my children have held these red balloons and they've let them go. And I know it's a small joy to them, um, but uh, I don't necessarily have uh, the same um, investment level. Um, I've taken photos at times of the balloons in the sky after a touchdown or made a joke that everybody, you know, premature, uh, you know, release of the balloon when a, when a, when a penalty calls a touchdown back. But um, at the end of the day, um, when Trev Alberts said what he said about the red balloons last night, the thing about the helium is legitimate. It is unbelievably expensive at this moment. About a third. I found this out on Radio France International. Mm. About a third of the world's helium is produced by Russia. Hmm. They had a new plant go online in the far east of Russia. And, of course, people who know the geography of Russia know that Russia extends all the way beyond every uh, every nation in the Pacific Ocean, I think, all the way out to, you know, almost touching Alaska. And so this plant is, this plant is uh, all the way out there. Uh, and, it you know, I think it was helping supply helium for... <laughs> Not only, you know, the, the countries around the Pacific Ocean, such as Japan and China and others, but also partially the United States. Mm. And, of course, we're not, we're not receiving any imports, I believe, from Russia at this time because of its invasion in Ukraine. So the cost of helium is absurd. According to a Miami Herald story, it is costing $1,800 a liter. They were wow. paying 74 Whoa. So if we can appreciate the cost of just making the red balloons each Saturday— and the the value of that that is that's part of the issue i know people will talk about the environmental impact i don't want to delve too far into that i do know there is an environmental impact we'll have a story about this tomorrow um, i know there is one i do think that's part of the concern but i really do think that the other part of the concern is helium uh, the cost of helium is like making the balloons out of gold not quite gold but you know what i mean some other precious metal so it's like blowing gold <laughs> into the heli- into the balloon. You, anyway, they need the helium for the UNMC MRI scanners and other things, so um, that's where it is. But did anything else jump out at you about his division? Talks about divisions or yes, talks about whatever. I wanna? I had the his comments about divisions jumped out to me. But first, I would like to say you could make a real juicy clickbait headline out of that balloons Russia thing, like something like how the Red Scare impacts the Red Balloons or something like that. You could do yeah, something. Yeah, it's not the Red Scare, you but I do, understand what yeah, you mean. You could, do, you could do something with that. <laughs> um, the, part, okay. the, part, the part about the divisions that jumped out to me Sorry. With, <laughs> with Trev Alberts talking about divisions last night is that he a guy who whose program it directly disadvantages to have divisions eliminated eliminated came out in favor of eliminating divisions and i'm trying to rack my brain as to why i think the best thing i can come up with is it could be like a vote of confidence for for nebraska right like i think if you put truth serum in the coaching staff right now they would all say it's probably not a good thing for big 10 to eliminate divisions because it um, decreases their chances of playing for a big 10 championship but Mm -hmm. maybe trev is trying to play some 3d chess here and and inject some confidence by considering that, you know, maybe that's not the case. Nebraska can get up on the level of these Penn States, Michigans, whatever. I just thought that was interesting that he that he came out in favor of something that would hurt his program's chances of returning to national or even regional relevancy. Hmm. Yeah, well, you know, I think I think there's a possibility that it would I mean, obviously Nebraska hasn't been to the Big Ten championship since they went to East and West. So it's not like they've been real close. The only year in which they were rec- really close was 2014 and 2016. Um, and they weren't that close in 2016. If they would beaten Wisconsin in 2014, they would have gone to the Big Ten Championship and played Ohio State and been beaten very badly by the Buckeyes that year. Um, so, you know, I think there's something to be said for that. I agree that, uh, you know, there's something to be, uh, hey, we won the West. That's a That's something you can, you know, crow about you be getting rid of that crowing finishing second doesn't really mean much they remember uh, in 2012 when they won the big 10 west they got the hats sure i yeah. remember jeremiah Searles wearing the hat after maybe spencer long too they were in the hat in in, in kinnick you know the other thing is you go eight they don't no more hats no more division no more hats. hats you don't you don't get a hat for finishing second in the big 10 they were big 12 north there's merch for that too back That's in right. the day. The other thing is like you go eight and four, 
in with divisions, your your ceiling is the Rose Bowl. You go eight and four without divisions, you're not going to the Big Ten championship. You're going to maybe the Capital One Bowl or something like that. It's an interesting way of putting it. That's a good thought. Hmm. I I get that. It's is it unlikely that you will beat Ohio State, Michigan, whoever as an eight and four team? No, sure, but you're you just made a sixty really minutes from glory. Because what you mean to say is that an eight four team, which they have not done, right? That even that win is, the Big Ten championship. Yes. If you eliminate it, and that eight and four team will not be the number two team in the league. The standard for they will not be able to play yeah. for the Rose Bowl. They'll play for, they'll just their season will be over, and they'll go to Orlando. Yeah, that's a good point, Jimmy. I hadn't thought of that. It does remove the incentive yeah, a little bit, like once you hit that wall. I'm not sure it'll happen. I'm not sure they're going to get rid of it. Hmm. You know how you want to know why? Because they haven't gotten rid of it yet. I think it wouldn't the, have been anything to stop him from getting rid of it. Well, the media, you don't think, you don't buy Trev's explanation deal. about the media rights deal? I buy it, but uh, I think about that question for a second. Think about it. What would the media rights deal have to do with scrapping the divisions? I know, but I'm curious if you do. I don't. I want to know if oh, okay. Michigan Ohio yeah. State yeah if the the value of that game goes down because they might play again not if you move it I don't think if you move it it ain't the, worth the same money really mm-hmm. okay that's a part of the special of Ohio slot, State yeah. Michigan is Saturday noon 2 days after Thanksgiving it ain't middle of the season it's not that it is it's not Oklahoma Texas Could which be. which of the two games is bigger it's not not close. That's right. Some of that's because of where that game's at. Because, and I'll tell you why. If you go through the eighties, hell, if you go through the if you go through the in the seventies, the Ohio State Michigan game was bigger. In the eighties, Oklahoma Texas was bigger. You could argue there were times in the two thousands, yeah. from starting in nineteen ninety nine through two thousand five, when the biggest football game of the year, two thousand eight, biggest football game of the year was Oklahoma Texas. It was never as big as Ohio State Michigan. Part of that is because of where that game's at. If you play the Ohio State Michigan game the day, two days after Thanksgiving, and then those two teams have to play each other again in a week, boom, boom, boom. I mean, it's just no. What if you play it the first week of November? You can kind of maintain this. This doesn't. I don't think it changes much. I think the only thing that would change it is if you were able to create a um, Final Four where. What happens is Ohio State plays Michigan, and then there's like two weeks of playoff games. And one plays four, and two plays three. But even then again, you could have a potential rematch between Ohio State and Michigan. It would be back-to-back. The other question to ask is, what do they lose? What do they lose by keeping the divisions? What's wrong with it now? From the Big Ten's perspective. The Big Ten championship game is often a walkover. Okay. Is that a bad thing? I think so. Don't That's you want a coronation? If your goal is to have easier access to the college football playoff, then yeah, you would want your best team to have the clearest path to that point. Well, this, and, uh, this and also goes to the, what, my point last week about what if they make the conference championship games an automatic qualification. But they've removed that restriction, right? That's what the NCAA has done. They, you don't need a conference championship. Or right, but I'm, saying, I'm talking about for the suppose. playoff, like in the future, it could be if they expand the playoff that you win your conference, you are in the college football then playoff. Then it becomes a different story. But yeah. then, then, see, that's the thing. They don't know that, though. Right. I think that's likely, though. They don't know that. Well, the Big Ten wants it, Jimmy. Other leagues don't. The other leagues do not want that. Now, it doesn't mean that it wouldn't most likely happen 99% of the time. But they don't want that. The reason, so the thing that you could argue is if you keep the divisions, then it it makes all of the games meaningful in the West. If you scrap the divisions, are you risking an, an Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State Invitational? Are you risking that? You know? And the question is, is I, I don't know. Could you also increase your chances of getting multiple teams in the playoff by doing that? Because 
Maybe. Yes. Yeah. Well, if you went to 12, yeah, yeah. They, the Big Ten would get at least two and yeah. perhaps three every year. But I don't know. Like, it's it's a tricky conversation because the, there's really nothing wrong from the Big Ten's perspective with Ohio State winning the Big Ten title every year or Michigan winning it. Now, who does that hurt? Nobody's bothered by that. It's good to have a villain. You know, there's there's nothing there's but nobody's bothered by those two things. And so, like, is Ohio State, Michigan going to be willing to change, or are they going to be willing to risk that they might play each other twice and play each other back to back? The next question is, and this is I think important: name me the greatest conference championship game of all time. Eh. Got one. Name me the great. I don't know. I think it's hard to name the greatest anything of all time, but. I think that's could be because there's not a ton of weight placed on them right now. So they, why? So so there why? Maybe soon. Why? Why gear anything you do toward that game if it doesn't matter? You could make it matter more. That could. part of part of the reason could be because we're getting all these walkovers in sure. the championship games. Sure. My 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 point being that like I would say the greatest game ever played in a conference title game was the SEC championship between Georgia and Alabama in 2012, where Aaron Murray good. is intercepted with four seconds left. The Hurts and, game, you know. yeah. Uh, that was a different game. Yeah, uh, The Hurts same game teams, was, though. yeah, it was the same teams. Um, there's been a couple of classics in the SEC. There actually was an incredible Big Ten championship game between Iowa and Michigan State. Went right yeah, down to the end, 16-13. Yeah. The very first one was very good with, with Kirk Cousins against against Russell uh, Wilson. Of course, Russell Wilson won that game because he's the better quarterback. Um, but generally speaking... What the conference title games have functioned beautifully as is a television property. They are not, and, and of course the 2009 Big 12 championship game, memorable. They function really well as a television property. That's what they do. They don't necessarily function as a, unless it's in the SEC, a knockout game. And there's been a number of times where the Pac-12 has had a team lined up, Utah a couple of years ago, and they get knocked out because they lose in the title game. And so... I think my point is that, like, why create a system that has any, like, that helps you determine who should play in those two games at all? I think that the driving, the driving thought process behind it is, well, the reason you get rid of divisions is because, to be quite frank, you, you, you're not playing all the teams you know, over the course of four years, like. Nebraska could go four years between playing Penn State. They could go, they you know, a whole class of Huskers could come through and never play a game at, oh, well, I don't know that you'd want to, but play a game at Rutgers or at Michigan or at Michigan State or at Ohio State. And I think there's a thought process there that, like, what's really a problem is that Nebraska doesn't really need to play Purdue and Northwestern and Illinois every year. They need to play their little, little pod, build rivalries there, and then treat in Purdue just like you do Michigan State. I don't. I don't have a. I don't. I don't have a burning desire to ever go. No, it's no offense to that place. It's a lovely you gotta, campus. You gotta drag that I have campus no, every opportunity. I have, no, you the get. campus is okay. Or whatever. I just have no burning desire to make the two and a half hour drive down from Midway Airport and sit on the back of a golf cart going to Ross Aid Stadium no. ever again. No, no. It's a beautiful. It, it, the campus is actually quite pretty. Um, it is. It's a nice it's campus. Fine. Yeah, it's fine. But I don't have a burning desire to ever do that again. So, like, I can't imagine the Nebraska coaches are like, now nah, here's one thing we get to do. You know, like, I just... Now, Indiana wants to play Purdue every year, and I'm sure Purdue wants to play, you know, someone. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? <laughs> yes. Now, I kind of like going to Northwestern. I like going up, the, up the train and going to Mustard's Last Stand and getting a dog and then going inside and watching... Half, you know, kind of a neutral site game in a nice city. That's cool, but you know, I don't, I don't ever have any burning desire to go back to Champaign, Illinois, either. Agreed. And sit way up top and look at a field that looks like it's been faded by the sun, and you know, walk by that photo of Lou Tepper, and mm-hmm. you know, all the coaches that they have, the photos that they have in the lobby of, you know, Ron Zook and Lou Tepper, and. All the other coaches Brown they've Zook. had. Yes. I don't have any burning desire to return to that place. I'm guessing Nebraska football fans don't either. No, I don't think so. Uh, I agree. Like, and, and and part of me is like, if you if you're really gonna switch anything up, you, you wonder if like switching up divisions would make sense. Like, why not just reshuffle things? Because when they made the East and the West, it was with the idea that 
it was somewhat balanced. You know, obviously Ohio State and Michigan were your powers, but like, you know, Wisconsin looked better then than they do now. Nebraska, there was still, I think, more legitimate hope that they would take the bull by the horns than they have. Um, and then Northwestern's won the thing. So I don't know, like, what if you scrap geography for the divisions and you and you shuffle that up a little bit, put Penn State in, in one opposite of, uh, of Ohio State and Michigan, keep those two together to preserve the rivalry and to prevent, um, you know, a rematch. But, like, I, I agree. Like, I don't the, – because the Big Ten hasn't rushed – to scrap divisions to me suggests that they still see a good amount of value in it as they protect some of their top games. Basketball, Jimmy, lap man leaving. Lap man leaving. It was a good run. <laughs> <laughs> Any memories of that? <laughs> good uh, guy. There's the Rutgers game from, from 2021 where you had five threes and scored 25 points, most of which came before halftime. Um, I do think that um, everyone on that team respected him. Uh, I think that he was, at, he's not the loudest guy, but I think that he was, he was a guy who could, if things were going sideways, call a huddle and, you know, people would listen to what he had to say and they might bleed 10 more points after that huddle, but that's not necessarily his fault. Um, I don't, the story, the story of, I guess the story of Latman's Nebraska tenure is Latman's jump shot, which came and went. Um, the, and they really needed it, and it to be like a came, 45% right. three-point shooter. It came and went, and went and went and went and went. When he when he went on droughts, he went on long droughts. What was his number this year? In 29.9%. Yeah, like, that's just, you can't, had, you it, can't it, have that. And he's out there to be, to be a stretch 40. four. He's supposed to be a floor spacer. Oh, you can't you can't have that. So um, mm. it didn't work out. He already he made, he made all four of his threes, according to the box score, in his first Australian professional game. I guess that's my other takeaway from this news is that no one really knew. No one really knew it was coming. Um, when it was coming, no, yes, everyone knew that this was going to be the, the path that he chose. But no one, he didn't tell anyone. It doesn't sound like like Nebraska. I was. I talked to Seamus McKnight, the SID today, and I don't think he was necessarily like. I don't think he was had that press release ready to hit send on. Um, I think it was. Lat was just moving on with his life and focused on that he's not he's never been a big social media guy which i respect i don't think you have to announce every step that you take in your life would have been helpful for me but that's okay <laughs> i don't know i mean he was a good guy i liked Lad a lot he, he wrote a real good yeah. story about him he's cool um, his family's his, cool. his life and and you know he's been a few places um uh, second game of his career he he had a three to tie the game I think against Nevada and he turned it down and it, it made no sense because he made he had a first good really good first game it's just you know Nebraska's got to get the way I would put it is they've got to get one of these transfers that they get to really 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 be good and Trey McGowan's was good but he wasn't I mean Trey was hurt and there was other things going on they need one of these transfers to be really special to pop yeah and like I think Sam Griesel is the guy that would. You can argue Delano Banton was that. I mean, he got drafted in the NBA, but Delano was hit was hit and miss too. Teddy Allen was hit and miss as well. Like they have to find a guy that's just consistently good. And CJ Wilcher may be that guy. I thought CJ was extremely dependable over the last half of the season. He did what you wanted him to do, which yeah. was make threes. Yeah, and sh- even showed a little bit more off the dribble shake than than he showed at the beginning of the season. Um, I think. You can, I mean, you can see the way they're going. They've they've added uh, three grad transfers. They want <clears throat> they want steady. They want um, you look at the like where they're grabbing guys. Sam North Dakota State. Sam Grizel is a winning program. SMU is a winning program. Won twenty games last year. Um, Juwan Gary, the Alabama is a burgeoning winning program. So they're this is more of a bet. I was thinking about how to phrase the shift in dynamic the other day when just kind of looking at the roster. I think this team is more likely to, I think the, the parts themselves, we want to use the sum of the parts analogy. Some of the parts themselves should add up to less, but I think these parts added together are more likely to add up more. The sum of these parts are likely to add up to more than what they should than last Mm -hmm. year's group would. Can't be any agendas. Yeah, that's what I mean. You saw Sam did an interview with 
a podcast which of the name of which I am forgetting right now last week, and yeah. that's something that he said. That's what everyone says at this time of year. And there's no selfish guys on this team. I, I kind of believe it a little bit more this time around. There are like you think about. And I'm not casting aspersions on any of these guys, but Alonzo Verge had one year to prove that he was an NBA guy last year. Bryce McGowan's. Well, Bryce had an agenda too. Well, no, I'm, I'm, we're getting there. Yeah. We're getting there. Bryce yeah. McGowan's came in thinking he was going to be a one and done guy, and this Idiot. was my NBA yeah. mixtape season. So. No. These guys are less like that. Of course, everyone wants to play in the NBA, but I think that when you have a guy who needs to play four years to get to the NBA, it's just different. I totally agree. Um, and the year before, Teddy Teddy wanted to, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, and he looks like he's going to have a chance mm-hmm. now that he's went to a smaller school and dominated there. But and Banton Banton was actually quite unselfish, so he yeah. didn't have an agenda. But I think agendas are the thing they've got to try to get rid of. And they've just got to find a way to – it's got to be all about winning. Mm-hmm. You know? It's got to be all about winning. And, and then I, you said you need we'll these, these transfers. I think they need one of the freshmen to pop, like one of the new guys. Sure. Ramel Lloyd and Jamarcus Lawrence, Jamarcus Lawrence in particular. Um, I was texting with a coach who thinks that, that Emmanuel Bandemil has some untapped playmaking potential. But the fact is that dude just never has never been a – a decision maker with the ball in his hands at the division one level. He's been right. like a three and D guy and maybe there is more there, but I, you know, even if it is, even if that's true, I don't think him and, and Sam are going to be enough in that guard. They need more pop. They need Ramel Lloyd to provide that or Jamarcus Lawrence, somebody. I think they, they could have the best defensive team they've had in some time. It's very possible. They, so they, they went. You want they weren't great defensively the first three years. Another dynamic know. shift. Look at who the guards were last year. Look at who the guards were this year. Last year, Kobe Webster, Alonzo Verge, Casey Tominaga. Casey's still here, but and those Trey. are and he was healthy. Yes, right. But he wasn't. What are the commonalities between most of those guys? Short, shifty, jitter buggy guys, offense first. Sam 6'6. Six, six. It's not like that. Manuel Bandamel. 6'4", not mm-hmm. like that. Um, Mel Lloyd's 6'6". Six, six. It's not like they're big now. And they, Vandermel they can, was supposed to be, is a defender. Yes, that's how he thinks of himself. Juwan Gary is the same way. He thinks of himself as a defense-first guy. So there's there's certainly a, si- a sizable shift happening here. You hear Trev saying that he wants Fred to make himself uncomfortable. I think we've done we've seen that. This is different. Now we're going to see if that zone is what they th- mm-hmm. what they think it'll be. Mm-hmm. I don't even, you think they'll run it? I do think they'll run it. I think they're gonna. I don't think they can run it one thousand percent of the time, but I think it'll be their base defense. Yeah. Interesting. I think they'll get shot out of it sometimes. You, get, you bleed. You can bleed threes. That's supposed to trap, right? Yeah. In, in women's college basketball, there's a guy that used to do this. He still coaches. His name is Matt Bowen, and they call it the buzz defense. That's what they call it there. And Northwestern runs it too. If you want to watch a women's basketball team do it, they do it. And it's exactly that. It's a zone mm-hmm. that all of a sudden morphs into. And what's interesting is that the Nebraska women's basketball team became very, very proficient at beating both of those defenses. Lately, we got really good at it. And what does Nebraska do really well? They shoot threes. Right. Like the, they just they became. It's it's very for what it's worth for people. It's actually really hard to run zones in women's basketball. The coaching is so good. The shooting is so good. And you don't have uh, players who are so long, yeah. like a 6'7". Hard to cover as much ground. Yeah. It's hard to zone for very long in women's college basketball without getting filleted uh, by a really good team. It's just very hard to do. In men's college basketball, you can try to pull it off. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. All right. That is our podcast for the week. For Evan Bland, I'm Jimmy Watkins. No, you're not. You're Jimmy Watkins. I'm Sam McEwen. And uh, we'll be back next week to talk about a huge recruiting weekend. Friday Night Lights. I think it's going to be a new kind of Friday Night Lights. I really do. Uh, and maybe, you know what? I was thinking maybe we'll have Chattel come in. Because I think it's time to talk to Tom. That's a treat. He doesn't know that I'm going to <laughs> invite him in. But I think it's time to talk to him just about everything that's been going on with with all three of the sports, but particularly football. I think uh, I'd be interested to hear his perspective on what has been a really busy off season and appears to be, I, I just can't remember an off season like this. Five new coaches, fifteen transfers, thirty-two, thirty-one, thirty-two new players. Wow. Mm-hmm. One year, 
to get it done. This bold. We'll see if it works. Thanks for listening, Husker fans.